Good evening, and welcome to Woman. My guest this evening is one of my favorite novelists. She is Lois Gould. Lois is a journalist as well as a novelist. She's the author of Such Good Friends, Necessary Objects, Final Analysis, and X, A Fabulous Child Story. Her new novel, A Sea Change, published recently, has caused considerable controversy. Lois, welcome. Nice to be here. I'm family. going to read a little bit from a review of A Sea Change. And it's Doris Grumbach, and it's the Chicago Tribune Book World. I will understand it perfectly when other readers say they dislike to see change intensely. I will be sympathetic to whispers and cries suggesting confusion, dismay, perhaps even lack of understanding. But to all the inevitable naysayers of delicate sensibilities, I wish to say at once, I think Lois Gould's new novel is startling, original, beautifully written. That's a terrific review. I liked it, too. Why wasn't that in the New York Times? I wish I knew. If it, ha if it had been, I think uh, it would have signaled to a great many people um, things that, that I felt were important about the book that Doris Grumbach um, noticed, reacted to. And even though her reactions were highly personal, and she said elsewhere in that review, she had some questions, she had some confusions, she had some interpretations that she was longing to get corroboration for. Um, her review was enormously um, warming to the heart because she read carefully and she read well and she read the way one wishes to be read, which is with thought um, and, and, with, and with respect. And um, it, it was quite beautiful to, uh, to be responded to the way one wished. Uh, well, what do you did. think, you know, the book has become very controversial. What do you think is hard about the book for people to accept? I know there's several things. Several things. I think um, the use of the fantasy um, or the, the space in which the, right, the reader has to decide for herself or for himself what is real and what is not real and what is really happening and what is not really happening and is this uh, reality or am I in some other world that kind of space is something that readers are not accustomed to very much now. They read quickly, they read inattentively, and they expect to have it all very simple and on one level. And this book asks for them to pay attention, which is hard enough in this world. Um, there are also a number of elements in the book besides the fantasy, such as violence and the erotic aspects not only of the violence or of the implied violence, but of uh, different combinations of people and the ambiguities of relationships and the changing of relationships. The book is um, very changeable as you were reading it, and that means the ground under the reader is shifting and sliding, and that's an uncomfortable place to be in when you want to curl up with something that is called a good read or a page turner. You don't want to have to say, hey, where am I? Uh, because you lose your moorings, and you lose sexual moorings, and you lose reality moorings, and all of that is discomforting. And there are many, many changes. It is a, it is a very erotic book. And I'm interested in, in why, in books by women, certain kinds of eroticism is acceptable, and other kinds are not. I don't know why that is either, except that I think we are in a time of violent change about erotic principles and erotic patterns, and some eroticism in books by women is reassuring to people who would like it to be familiar terrain and to to be able to hitch their their sexual wagons to and say, aha, I've been here before and this is where I like to be. And if you are saying, no, it isn't that way, it is some other way and either I do not like what it is that you always thought I liked, or I question that, and I am trying this, and this is different, and it is very interesting to me, and you are not with me at this moment. All of that is scary. It's scary to men, and it's scary to many women who either are finding the erotic elements in their lives for the first time and exploring them, or don't want to find them, or have a feeling that something terrible awaits them if they do find it, and uh, all of these raisings of questions that people are uncomfortable about raising um, make one very skittish. What about Jesse Waterman, who is the 
main character in the novel. What about her relationship with the other woman? Is this something that you think people are finding unacceptable to an extreme point? I, I don't know about that. I think there has been a tradition of acceptance of some woman-to-woman -woman erotic connections in books and in film, certainly, which have been considered not particularly seriously threatening because men who see pornographic movies as a hobby have always liked a little woman-woman interaction. It never seemed particularly upsetting or serious. It is only upsetting or serious if the man never comes in at the end of the scene and takes over or asserts the need of the woman to be ultimately satisfied by the man. And the point at which homosexuality becomes truly threatening or frightening is when the male observer really feels he has been um, eliminated from the scene or in some way rejected. I don't know that, that there is any implicit um, political position in, in any uh, female homosexuality, but it's never really been studied. It's never really been taken seriously. Most of the studies that have ever taken place on homosexuality have concentrated on men. I think one of the things that we, the mistakes we make about writers when we read novels is that we assume that everything is a statement and that you believe everything that you describe and you approve of it. Is this true? I think it does happen sadly more often than it should because the writer has been invested particularly at this time when we are as I said a little confused and a little off balance the writer has been looked upon as a visionary, as a spokesperson for whatever is happening or should happen. And the tendency to read very literally what the novelist says, what the fiction writer says, as either gospel truth or political ideology is very hurtful to the imagination. If the writer is writing an imaginative work, then to either have her own politics question or the politics of her heroine, which is fairly frequent question, attacked or uh, discussed as the basis for, for criticism, seems very irrelevant. You say, but this is what I invented or this is what I dreamed or this is where my imagination took me and why are you holding me responsible for my heroine's attraction to the man in her life or the woman in her life or the child in her life? This is a person that I have created, and it isn't me, and it isn't what I think you should do. It's fiction. But the acceptance of fiction is uh, uh, very difficult to retain in a world that is rooted in tell me true, tell me what you are really like. I wish to read about you in People magazine, and I don't want to know where your mind takes you because I need a formula for me for now. And I think that's hard. I think um, the place of fiction is hard to cling to in a time of crisis. Are you making any predictions with that book? I don't know. I think I may be making um, interpretive statements about present and near future rather than a long-term prediction for how things must be or where, where people must go and how they must relate to each other. The beginning of the book, of course, is a reference to a fish called the wrasse. Uh, and its peculiar mode of life, which involves the assumption to maleness of the dominant female of the harem upon the death of the male. And it's a very brief reference, but of course it is the basis for the whole allegory. And of course that is uh, the present way the Ras lives, and the Ras has no choice any more than people have in its sexuality or its assumption of sexual behaviors of different kinds at different stages in its life. So the allegory, if it is an allegory, uh, insofar as it is an allegory, um, stems from a present reality rather than any kind of formula or, or political uh, prognostication or certainly medical prescription for where, where we must be or how we will be from here on. I don't know. But do you see it as that, though? You, you know, I really, I think I want a yes or no from you. <laughs> see, you see. 
Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, if, what? if pinned down, I would give you a very positive I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll let you off the hook for the moment. What do you think women want from women novelists? Because I think they do want something. Answers. Yeah. Answers. Women novelists have become a fairly articulate and kind of uh, unified seeming group of spokespersons for the moment. They are obviously thoughtful and reflective. They do look at themselves and look at the world around them. And they write about it, and they write about it in emotionally gripping ways, those of them who, who are widely read and, and assumed to be um, eloquent or, or uh, in some way capturing the voice or the mood or the emotional uh, question of many women. So insofar as they are speaking to many women, they become transformed into speaking to many women. And those women who are moved by their work look to them and say, tell me, do you mean that I should be thus and so, or do you right. mean that because you are thus and so, that's good, or uh, where exactly do you stand in relation to the people in your book? Are you for them? Are you against them? Do you love them or hate them? And what is your responsibility toward me now that you have grabbed my attention? And the difficulty is that as a novelist, one continues to cling to the idea that one is simply talking about one's private visions. And if they touch people, that is all one has asked. One has not asked to be uh, rocketed to some pulpit uh, and told, speak and tell me how I must act at this, at this moment. And because of what you know, you are a guru or a, uh, a wise woman, an elder. Well, that's really kind of what's happened. I mean, there are a group of women writers, Erica Jong, Joan Didion, I mean, the list is long, and, you're, and yourself included, of course, and you're all thought of the, as the current gurus. It's a heavy burden because that was not what we were about. And it's unfortunate that there is no other group in politics, there is no other group in sociology, there is no other group in education who seem as strong or who seem as um, visible. I think that's what it is, visibility. Many women have access to the thinking of the novelists. Not mm -hmm. so many women have access to the thinking of educators or political scientists, especially women in these fields, who are addressing themselves to the questions of being a woman and the future of being a woman. Um, and the novelist is by default cast in that spot, though she may claim, as I do, that was not, that was not why I came. That was not uh, why I chose to do this. I chose to do it out of my own inner needs. And I never said I could speak for you or for any other group. I'm torn, you know. I'm torn between understanding exactly what you're saying and, and wanting also to believe the other. <laughs> and wanting you to accept the role of the other, you know. For, for people who really need that. Because as you said, there's nowhere else to go, but really. It's a terrifying responsibility, and most of us, I know. being very introspective people, would pull back from that in, in, in some kind of horror and say, I am not qualified. I do not know about you. I only know about me. And your response would be, yes, but you speak to me, and your people are me. And therefore, I know that you know me. And how can you say this is not your responsibility? You must accept it. It's very hard. But what is your responsibility? I think my responsibility is no different from yours, which is to say what I feel in as honest a way as I can and to project it in my own medium and my own language so that it is understandable to you. And if you learn from that or if others learn from that and can accept things in themselves and recognize things in themselves from my work, I have done my job. And I think to point to certain truths and say, here it is, I name it, that's I'll go along with that, that's Lois. the extent. Every Sunday, I pick up the New York Times book section. And I don't see books by women being reviewed very frequently at all. In fact, most of the time, the reviews are totally about men. Uh, 
and the books that they have written. And when I do see a review about a book that a woman has written, it, chances are it's by another woman and the review is devastating. And what is going on? I can't believe that this is all chance, circumstance, or whatever. It really is, I think, upsetting and a plot, it looks like to me. I don't know if it's a plot. I think it's an inevitable uh, period during which the work by women that is challenging is extremely hard to assimilate by people, men, and some women who are not accustomed to having that ground shifting under them and don't know how to assess it other than by pulling away from it or saying either it doesn't really touch what I believe to be the roots of literature or the roots of culture in our time. I know what those rules are and I've lived by them forever and this is some interloper or group of interlopers to whom I do not have to listen at this moment. It is unsettling. Therefore, I will either ignore it or I will say it is not relevant to the mainstream of literature which I have related to all my life. So you will find a sort of conservative core of reviewers who assess women's books in a context which was never designed to include them because they are saying things that, uh, that those people do not wish to hear or do not wish to understand. And the impulse to pull back and not to listen is very strong. I think it's going to take time before you build up a receptivity to serious women critics, before you build up the possibility of accepting them in the fraternity of male critics and into the fraternity of publishers. They have advanced, women have advanced in publishing tremendously in the last few years, and they're nowhere in the critical fraternity. And that's an astonishing difference. And I think it's important because the reception of the books by critics is quite different from the reception of the books by women readers, who are obviously a huge block of Right, of exactly. Fiction and they readers. wouldn't be publishing them if they weren't making money, right? That's right. But money is not the name of the game in the hardcover publishing men's fraternity. You have this, this image of the great literary judge, like an Edmund Wilson, sitting in his book line study, puffing contemplatively on his pipe and saying, this is good, this is bad, this shall live, this shall die. And that is what is being clung to as an image of judgment of excellence. So that which does not conform to the rules laid down 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago as great, not great, acceptable, not acceptable, has no place except very marginally. So they will permit a woman's book to be published, which reaches a wide audience of women, but they can still protect themselves, I think, against the possibility of challenge to the principles by saying, well, it's a special thing and it belongs here. And we will look at it at a distance, at a safe distance, with a safe pole of whatever length. That's exactly the impression one gets from looking at the makeup of the Times book section. I suppose. But I think it will change because I think reading habits change, judgments change, populations of readers change, women critics do emerge. There are some wonderful ones, Doris Grumbach. I may be terribly partial to Doris Grumbach at the moment, but she is a fine critic and she's mm -hmm. an acknowledged fine critic even by her male peers and associates, but there are many other younger women critics who are coming along publishing in some places, not necessarily constantly in the New York Times, but other places, and they are thoughtful, reflective, wise, and um, But in the meantime, perceptive. you know, before all of these things are righted that we consider as wrongs at the moment, the fact that there are no women critics and, and, you know, the way women are treated by publishers. In the meantime, you have to survive. They're not treated badly by publishers. Publishers stand to gain from publishing them, and so they do. Well, I 
you know, I don't want to get into a big discussion at, at this point of how they're treated by publishers, but I do know some women who've been treated very badly by publishers. I think that's probably true. Advantage of. And, and there are uh, some women writing fiction that publishers will not touch because right. they are so challenging and innovative and strange, and there is no way to relate to them. And people will look at a book that is about some theme that is totally foreign. Right. And will say, I can't publish that. Right, but in the meantime, there are several, you know, some of the names that we mentioned, including yourself, you have to survive. How do you do that? I guess by writing as well as one can and ultimately binding up one's wounds and, and uh, paying attention to one's craft and saying over and over, I am published, I am writing, I am able to make my way as a writer, and this is something that might not have happened whatever number of years ago, and if I have this much, the perspective begins to take over and you say, um, I am here and I must do what I do, and if there is reaction against it, that is further proof that what I am doing is worth doing, and certainly worth doing well, if at all. So you do that. Okay. <laughs> You try. You try, right. You try. One of the things that I've really been anxious to talk to you about is male-female relationships and how possible you think they are at this point. Now, I, I know lots of people watching are going to know what you've said in several of the novels um, about male-female relationships, but I would just like to hear you talk about what you think is possible at this point in time. I think um, we have to face the fact that we are raised as enemies. Boys are taught one set of rules and girls another, and they are, from a very early time, acknowledged enemies. The boys won't talk to the girls, and the girls won't talk to the boys. And um, then there comes a point in adolescence where the culture says, okay, now everybody out of their corners, get together, genitals first, relate and they are forced to relate as sexual prey or hunter or vice versa or partners. But the partnership is so limited as to be extremely limited, uh, limiting to the rest of their lives. And the whole history of the enmity eventually overpowers the genital attraction, which was probably exaggerated to make up or cover up all of the other stuff that went before. You don't suddenly come out of that corner at age 14 loving girls if you're a boy. You don't love girls, but you love the idea of whatever the culture has said to do with two, four, against girls. And uh, it's very poignant to see these total strangers who have been brought up in, in such opposite worlds trying to come together and understand each other and reach some sort of base of friendship and base of mutuality that has nothing to do with sex but surpasses it and transcends it and makes a friendship. There are people that we all know who have never had a friend of the opposite sex because the basis for the relationship was supposed to be sexual attraction. If you were not sexually attracted to the person, you didn't become that person's friend. And I think this remains with us, and until it's superseded by some other conditioning and training process, um, you're never going to get to the point where you begin as friends and end as lovers. You will begin as enemies, become lovers, obliterating the enmity, and then the enmity will come out after the sexual exhilaration So wears. it's impossible? It's only possible if you retool, if you retool for another industry, which is learning to be human. And if you train all children to be human and to relate to all other children as human, which is uh, within reach if you don't have enforced male-female separation from birth, if you do that, you have a chance. But I think even our children, who have been raised in, in a culture with violently uh, asserted uh, differentiation at every level. Boys should do this, girls must do that. Right. Girls cannot do this. Uh, if boys do that, um, there's something wrong with them. Um, 
you've got to eliminate a great deal of that before you will get a generation that relates as friends and then as lovers. Lois, we only have about a minute. A minute ago we talked about obligation and obligation to the reader. Do you feel an obligation to other women who write? As against other women who read? Yes. <laughs> yes, I think, um, I think one's obligation is to all women, both writing and reading, because one, one is of them and one is speaking to them as friends. I won't say sisters, but certainly as friends. There is a link, and the link between the one who comes after and the one who is in front is growing stronger, and you want it to, and you feel a tremendous uh, exhilaration from response, not only from a woman who says to you, I have read your book and loved it or it moved me, but to someone who says, I read your book and I'm now able to write because you've said things that I thought I must always keep hidden, and so now the things that I feel hidden can come forward, and that's quite a beautiful bond. On that note, I thank you for being here, Lois. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you for watching, and good night. <laughs>